uh, right at two o'clock. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce myself. My name is Cheryl Pemberton. I'm with the New Continent Public Library, and we're really glad you could join us this afternoon. Um, I just want to ask if you could be sure to keep your mic muted throughout the program. Uh, I will include a link to a survey, and I'll put that in the chat at the beginning of the program and the end of the program. So if you could uh, take it just a minute after the program to complete the survey, we'd appreciate it. And if you have questions throughout the program, please put them in the chat, and then we will uh, answer them as time allows at the end of the program. Uh, so right now I want to introduce you to our presenter. Dr. Joan Stack is a curator of art collections at the State Historical Society of Missouri, a position that she's held since 2006. She received her PhD in art history from St. Louis's Washington University in 2000 and worked for five at MU's Museum for five years at MU's Museum of Art and Archaeology before taking the art curator position at the State Historical Society. She has curated over 75 art exhibitions and published nationally and internationally. Most recently, her scholarly work has focused on Missouri's uh, Missouri artist George Caleb Bingham and Thomas Hart Benton, as well as the relationship of material culture imagery to American history and society. Thank you so much for joining us today, Joan. <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, so this is E Pluribus Unum, Unity and Union in George Caleb Bingham's election series. So let's get started. Dateline, January 20th, 2017. Donald Trump is inaugurated as the 45th president of the United States of America on the steps of the Capitol. Shortly after the ceremony, the newly installed president strolls through the Capitol Rotunda into Statuary Hall. Until the late 1850s, this circular chamber housed the United States House of Representatives. More recently, the space has been used for consequential speeches, meetings, and events. It has also been the location of the traditional post-inauguration bipartisan luncheon attended by the new president and the leaders of the House and Senate. On this day, the new president, Donald Trump, and his wife, Melania, are seated at a table with the new vice president and his wife, as well as the bipartisan leadership of the Senate and House. Behind them, the final picture of George Caleb Bingham's famous election series, The Verdict of the People, painted in 1855, hangs in a place of honor on loan from the St. Louis Art Museum. Since 1985, an American painting has been selected to serve as a backdrop for the head table at the inaugural luncheon. The tradition started with President Ronald Reagan's second inauguration, at which Jasper Cropsby's 1860 landscape, Autumn on the Hudson, hung in the place of honor. Created by a great artist of the Hudson River School, Cropsey's painting represented America's epic natural beauty. In 1989, during the inaugural lunch of President George H.W. Bush, Rembrandt Peale's 1824 portrait of George Washington as Patre Potter, our father of his country, hung behind the president's table. The Peale portrait celebrated the 200th anniversary of the very first presidential inauguration in April of 1789. When William Jefferson Clinton took office in 1993, Thomas Sully's 1856 portrait of Thomas Jefferson, long hailed as the founder of the Democratic Party, hung in Statuary Hall. The painting commemorated the 250th anniversary of Jefferson's birth in 1743. In 1997, after Clinton was reelected, Sully's Jefferson reappeared together with a portrait of President John Adams by E.F. Frazier Andrews. The pictures recognized the 200th anniversary of the inauguration of John Adams as president and Thomas Jefferson as vice president. In 2001, George W. Bush's inaugural committee chose a 1902 painting by the Philadelphia American Impressionist Colin Campbell 
entitled West Front Steps to the Capitol. This painting celebrated the 200th anniversary of the first presidential inauguration in Washington, D.C. For Bush's second inauguration in 2005, Wind River, Wyoming by Albert Bierstadt commemorated the 200th anniversary of the expedition of Lewis and Clark, which took place between 1803 and 1806. For Barack Obama's first inauguration in 2009, Thomas Hill's View of Yosemite Valley was displayed. This painting marked the 160th anniversary of California statehood and celebrated the beauty of the home state of the chairwoman of Obama's first inaugural committee, California Senator Dianne Feinstein. For Obama's second inaugural lunch, Frederick Rickhart's 1856 painting of Niagara Falls hung behind the lead table. This painting celebrated the natural beauty and grandeur of the home state of the chair of the 2013 inaugural committee, New York Senator Charles Schumer. The Obama inaugurations established a tradition of having the chair of the inaugural committee select a painting for the luncheon related to his or her home state. Senator Roy Blunt was the chairman of the Trump inaugural committee in 2017 and he selected a painting by one of Missouri's favorite sons, George Caleb Bingham. In 2017, the inaugural committee broke precedent, however, by choosing a 19th century genre painting representing a political scene rather than a more neutral landscape or early presidential portrait to hang behind the presidential table at the luncheon. During his remarks, Senator Blunt commented on the meaning of the image representing the announcement of election results at a courthouse during the 1850s. The Senator described the crowd of figures in Bingham's painting, stating, quote, all kinds of people are in this painting, people from all walks of life, people who are excited, people who are confused, people who wonder what's happened, and people who wonder what's going to happen. All are there. Actually, he painted this painting about the same time that in this very room, some of the least successful debates in the history of our country were being held. And of course, we paid the price for not being able to find solutions. At that moment, President Trump mouthed the words, the Civil War, reminding Melania who was not born in the United States, that the picture was painted on the eve of that internecine conflict. Senator Blunt's perceptive description of the imagery in the painting made an implicit argument that the picture is about American democracy. And in this presentation, I will elaborate on that idea, arguing that verdict of the people together with Bingham's other election pictures, stump speaking and county election, were envisioned as quintessentially American images that made a visual argument that our nation's democratic institutions play a crucial role in shaping our national identity. In 1852, Bingham's closest friend, Missouri lawyer and statesman, James Rob Rollins, wrote a letter expressing such a sentiment to the American Art Union in New York. He hoped the Art Union would publish George Caleb Bingham's 1852 painting, County Election, as an engraving. The Art Union was founded in 1839 to advocate for creating a national art for the United States. The AAU operated a free gallery of American paintings each year in New York City. Members received an engraving of one of the exhibited paintings. Oops, excuse me. One of the exhibited paintings as part of their $5 annual membership. Now, here we go. Bingham's painting, The Jolly Flatboatman, had been chosen to be engraved by the Art Union in 1847. And you see that engraving here. Rollins hoped county election might be the choice for 1852. The picture was Bingham's most ambitious and complex composition to date, 
and Rollins had good reason to think that the art union might be open to engraving it. Given the mission of the art union to promote the art of the United States, Rollins argued that Bingham's county election represented a uniquely American subject. Quote, the elective franchise is the very cornerstone upon which rests our governmental superstructure. And as illustrative of our fine institutions, power and influence which the ballot box exerts over our happiness as a people, the subject of this painting was most happily chosen and executed with wonderful skill by its gifted author. But this was not to be. Rollins was unaware that the AAU had recently gone bankrupt. The last prints distributed were in 1851 and the organization auctioned off its assets in 1852. This organization's failure likely influenced Bingham's decision to independently commission an engraving of county election. He hired famed Philadelphia printmaker John Sartain, seen here, to make a large mezzotint engraving of the composition, and Bingham went to Philadelphia to supervise the process. The result was spectacular. The county election engraving was a great success when it was published in 1854, and it was eventually distributed by the international art and print dealing firm of Goupil and Company. It is still considered one of the greatest American engravings by print connoisseurs. The success led Bingham to create two more election pictures designed to be published as prints. Stump Speaking, painted in 1854 and published as an engraving in 1856, and Verdict of the People, painted in 1855 and made into a lithograph around 1858. But due to problems with the German printmakers and the outbreak of the Civil War in the United States, Verdict of the People was never published as a lithographic edition and only a few lithographic proofs of it survive, including one at the State Historical Society of Missouri. Prints were the fine art of the middle class who could not afford expensive oil paintings. Engravings and lithographs could be produced in multiples by the hundreds and even thousands, so they were relatively cheap. These prints democratized the ownership of fine art. They made artworks available to broad audiences of various classes, sexes, and ethnicities. Even poorer folks who couldn't afford the prints might have access to seeing them in sales rooms, offices, libraries, or the homes of acquaintances. Bingham's prints were high-end productions that were the size of small paintings. Many were hand-colored, framed and hung in places of honor in the homes of middle-class folks. The prints were sold throughout the United States to customers who had no idea who Bingham was or where he was from, but liked the picture. Remember, this was before the age of celebrity artists. The subject of the picture was often more important to the patron than the person who created the image. Given the fact that most 19th century folks knew of Bingham's art primarily through his prints, it is perhaps surprising that these consumers of the election series from the 1800s have often been ignored by scholars. Throughout most of the 20th century, art historians have tended to search for the meaning of the election pictures in Bingham's own personal experiences as a politician in Salem County in the 1840s. An old photo at the Arrow Rock Historic Site records identifications of characters in county election made by a former model of Bingham's, Dr. Oscar Potter. Many of the figures Potter identified were local folks in Arrow Rock who modeled for Bingham, or they were Saline County politicians who people in Missouri might recognize. Here are two Saline County politicians that some local Missourians of the time might have connected with figures in Bingham's county election. Meredith Miles Marmaduke, who has been identified as the man administering the oath to the voter in the picture, and Erasmus Darwin Sappington, 
the man who incidentally beat Bingham in a contested election in 1846. And he has been identified as the well-dressed man tipping his hat and offering a card to a voter at the center of the picture. Such identifications do offer a legitimate line of inquiry, but it's not what I'm here to talk about. I believe these pictures are about the 1850s, not the 1840s. Moreover, I'm interested in the broad political and social implications of the images to a national audience, and I think Bingham was too. Focusing on the specific models for the characters in the election paintings may provide helpful insight into the artist's personal inspirations and characterization choices. But this approach also parochializes the paintings and limits their communicative power. I believe that Bingham was more ambitious than that. The decision to contract with the international firm of Lupil to distribute stump speaking and county election out of the New York office in 1854 supports this view. Indeed, one can argue that the tendency to parochialize the election pictures has diverted attention away from their broad national appeal and relevance. Here, I have created imaginary interiors in which the print county election is shown hanging in a very middle class, in a variety of middle class 19th century homes in order to visualize the idea that Bingham's election pictures had the potential to communicate a variety of messages to a wide range of viewers beyond the borders of Missouri. In 2017, an anti-patriarchal online newsletter called the Trebich Times published an image of Bingham's county election and with humorous speech book bubbles and thought balloons that reflected the white supremacist sexist underpinnings of the culture represented in the painting. The post was generally critical of Bingham as a participant, uh, as a participant in the establishment of the era. But what I like about this image is that it shows the flexibility of Bingham's imagery. The thought balloons and word bubbles have been imagined by the online writer who speculates what the characters might be thinking or saying. It is not beyond the realm of possibility that the black man serving the drunk at left might have thought the words in his thought balloon, which are, have fun drinking crushed laughs. In other words, Bingham gives viewers a blank slate on which to impose imagined conversations and inner dialogues. The artist was sophisticated enough to understand the potential of a wide variety of imaginative narratives that might be created by a myriad of viewers. Bingham's election paintings, especially in their print culture context, can be understood in relation to the concept of synecdochic nationalism, described by historian of American art, Angela Miller. The artist presents a series of election scenes featuring a collection of recognizably American character types, settings, and political processes. And these scenes come to represent the larger concept of American democracy as a whole. Indeed, in Rollins' 1852 letter to the American Art Union mentioned earlier, the author makes this exact point, describing county election as, quote, a national painting, where it presents just such a scene as you would meet with on the era rustic in Maine, or the city of New York, or on the Rio Grande in Texas on an election day. Bingham has left nothing out. The courtier, the politician, the laborer, the sturdy farmer, the bully at the polls, the beer seller, the bruised pugilist, and even the boys playing mumble the peg are all distinctly recognized in the group, unquote. The late Tom Lubbock, art critic for the UK Independent, noted that Bingham's pictures differ from most political images in their focus on the by and large order, orderly electorate. Lubbock brings up an earlier election series, which Bingham likely knew from Prince, William Hogarth's Humors of an Election, 
which is also a collection of images representing the electoral process, but in England rather than the United States. And here you see Hogarth's The Polling of 1755. And this picture is actually composed much like Bingham's County election, but the interaction of the figures is much more chaotic and corrupt. Bingham borrowed compositional ideas from Hogarth. However, notice how few voters Hogarth actually depicts. His emphasis is on the corrupt bureaucracy and the political actors. Generally, Bingham's voters act in an orderly, responsible manner, although one man is trying to bring his drunk friend to the polls. Hogarth's scene, on the other hand, is rife with corruption. Partisans coach a mentally disabled man as he votes, and two others drag a dying man, or perhaps even a corpse, uh, to the voting place. Elsewhere, bureaucrats attempt to disqualify a disabled veteran because he is swearing on the Bible with a hook rather than his hand, as prescribed by law. In the background, the symbolic carriage of Britannia has been waylaid by a broken axle as the gambling and cheating coachmen ignore the crisis. Lubbock observed that Bingham's vision of the electoral process was anti-Hogarthian in spirit. He writes, this is an attentive, attentive electorate, unsophisticated but rational, who argue vigorously but nonviolently. They may be bored or not always understand, but they turn up. If in the details of the picture, there's a suggestion of some doubt about people power, its composition declares an underlying strength in the process. Rollins was in sync with Lubbock's reading of Bingham's election pictures. In the letter to the art union mentioned earlier, he called the United States election franchise the cornerstone on which the government's superstructure rests. Rollins recognized that shared political habits and practices connected Americans across party and regional lines, promoting a commitment to democratic ideals. The American universality of the painting was mentioned by Rollins, who stated that the scene would be familiar to voters in the city of New York or on the Rio Grande in Texas. This mention of the Rio Grande also obliquely connected the image to contemporary politics. The annexation of Texas in 1845 led to the Mexican War in 1846 which in turn resulted in the Mexican session in 1847. California was the first state formed from the session and came into the union as a free state in 1849. Now this worried the pro-slavery states who feared this was a step towards the eventual abolition of slavery. Fears of sectional division made the news nationally as this paper from Hannibal, Missouri dated July 11, 1850, indicates, and you see the mention of probable civil war. The short-term fate of the new Southwestern territories was the subject of heated sectional debates in the Senate. The famed Compromise of 1850, negotiated by Henry Clay and represented in this engraving, averted potential civil war. The future legality of slavery in the rest of the Mexican session, the New Mexico and Utah territories, was to be decided by the votes of the residents through popular sovereignty. The compromise temporarily averted civil war, appeasing Southerners hoping to expand slavery and Northerners hoping to restrict it. The idea that popular sovereignty would decide the future of slavery increase the importance of national and local elections. Americans would depend on democratic electoral practices and systems to withstand sectional strife. George Caleb Bingham conceived his election series amidst these circumstances. County election immediately after the 1850 compromise in 1851 and 52. It's prequel stump speaking in 1853 and 54, as Congress debated the Kansas-Nebraska Act, 
and its sequel, Verdict of the People, in 1855, as controversies were erupting over the elections in Kansas. The three images together presented a unified vision of the democratic process. Art historian Angela Miller has suggested that American paintings in sequence or series had political imp implications in the 19th century. In Empire of the Eye, she writes, quote, composite techniques of composition in which discrete scenes and elements were synthesized into a unified whole, acted out in artistic terms, the political principle of e pluribus unum, out of many one. Bingham's election series forms a sequential narrative one that, can, one, one that can be experienced by the viewer in time and space in a manner that is not unlike the experience of spectators viewing one of the popular moving panoramas that were displayed throughout the United States and Europe in the 19th century. And the experience could be replicated in middle-class homes with a collection of Bingham election prints. And here at the bottom, you see a man operating one of these moving panoramas before the crowd. He would unwind it and they would experience it in time and space. Some 19th century viewers may have consciously or unconsciously viewed the compositional unity of the three pictures as a visual metaphor for the strong structural framework many hope underpin American democracy. Bingham imposed aesthetic and compositional order onto America's messy electoral process which still, while still revealing its particularized shortcomings. In each picture, disruptive elements, such as a corrupt power broker, drunkards, and disinterested citizens, fail to destroy the overall harmony. Bingham uses the classical triangle as a design device. All three paintings feature a crowd of people adroitly arranged in triangular wedges that ascend to focal points occupied by citizen protagonists whose actions drive the great American drama. As one's eye travels through the series, it follows a course that rises and falls in a visual rhythm that mimics the pacing of a theatrical narrative. There is an introduction, rising action, a climax where the voter or sovereign in the democratic process casts his vote. There's falling action and a denouement that resolves the plot. In act one, stump speaking, the protagonist is a candidate for office. He is a citizen who offers his talents to the people for consideration. He leans towards the crowd, beginning the electoral process with an appeal to potential voters. His body forms the compositional apex of a wedge that descends rightward. Since Euro-Americans read from left to right, rightward movement often implies temporal progression in the art of their culture. Thus, the campaign begins with a candidate who submits ideas to the people. These ideas descend into the crowd of potential voters, suggesting that the next act will belong to them. Act two is the privileged central image of this secular triptych. Here, voters are the protagonists. The crowd that respectfully faced the potential at the political aspirant in stump speaking now turns right to face the courthouse where voting occurs. The composition swells upward as prospective voters stand in an orderly queue on the courthouse steps. The masses form an ascending wedge with a man voting at its apex. And you notice he's swearing on the Bible as he offers his voice vote to the clerk. The red shirt of this figure distinguishes him from the crowd. Some viewers may have associated the vermilion tone with emblematic liberty caps, such as those represented in this personification of the United States from the period. While others may have seen the humble red shirt of this citizen sovereign, and this was a term that was often used to describe American voters in the 19th century, 
as an ironic allusion to the scarlet robes of emperors and kings. This ordinary man is indeed the hero of this national drama. His vote will be tabulated by the agents of democracy who preside in the imposing governmental edifice at right. Act three, Verdict of the People, contains both the resolution and the denouement of this electoral drama. The porch of the courthouse is once again the setting, but the building is now on the left side of the picture, a position that suggests past action. The descending diagonal progresses downward, suggesting a time lapse as the people receive the news. We view their responses as reactions to the words of the speaker announcing the results. At the lowest point, a despondent figure sits on the ground, reflecting the inevitable disappointment felt by the losing side. Yet the final compositional axis swings upward, leading to a crowd of victorious celebrants who provide an optimistic coda to the series. Each of the three pictures includes children and their presence encourages viewers to contemplate the future of American democracy since these young European-American males represent future voters. The boys' actions in each painting reflect those of their adult counterparts. In stump speaking, we see the appeal. In county election, we see the contest. And in verdict of the people, we see the reward. Three boys reflect the appeal or salesmanship represented by the candidate in stump speaking. One holds out his hand as though he is asking his companion for something. While a third counts money, perhaps an allusion to counting votes. The astute viewer senses that the children are engaged in mercantile activity. The basket between the boys may contain a desirable commodity such as fruit or baked goods. The boy counting money may have just sold something to another boy, while the child who extends his hand is appealing to his comrade, perhaps the buyer who holds the goods, hoping to acquire some portion. The orator likewise appeals to potential voters, attempting to gain votes and sell his ideology. In county election, two boys play mumble the peg in the foreground while their elders vote. This knife throwing competition can be compared to the electoral contest. The metaphor is strengthened by the differentiation of the boy's clothing. One wears a straw hat that connects him with rural or agricultural interests while the other's clerk's cap associates him with the mercantile classes. The arrangement of the boys resembles a figural group in Henry Inman's painting, Mumble the Peg, painted a few years earlier in 1842, which Bingham likely knew. An engraving of Inman's picture had appeared in the popular yearly journal, The Gift of 1844, where writer C.F. Hoffman specifically describes the rival boys as representatives of different social classes. While Hoffman saw Inman's boys as representing a patrician and a peasant, in the context of county election, viewers would be more likely to see Bingham's children as personifying the differing interests of the Democrats, agrarian, and the Whigs, mercantile. The game is thus a contest, not unlike that being acted out nearby by voters of different classes and parties. In Verdict of the People, Several boys sit on the courthouse steps as the results of the election are read. One points to a notice board where information, perhaps about the results, is posted. The most prominent boy, however, is the youth at the far right in the narrative section of this election drama that I have labeled the denouement. This child holds his fingers to his lips as he watches a man slice watermelon. The refreshing fruit would be welcome on a hot day in August when Missouri held its statewide elections. The boy anticipates receiving this edible reward, 
which can be seen as representing the allegorical fruits of victory. While Bingham's election series is generally optimistic, the representation of slavery in all three images places a visual spanner in the works of American democracy. In all three cases, the black figures are involved in commercial activities that fuel the economy, yet they are excluded from its freedoms. As already mentioned, county election was conceived in the wake of the Compromise of 1850, and the future of slavery in the United States became an increasingly divisive issue throughout the 1850s. Bingham wrote to John Sartain that he designed county election to be, quote, applicable to every state in the union and illustrative of free people and free institutions. Yet his inclusion of a humble African-American in the picture implied a slave state setting and reflected the limitations of American freedom in the 1850s. All three election pictures were produced at a time when political tensions over slavery dominated national politics. As an elected official in 1849-50 and a vocal partisan thereafter, Bingham was actively involved in these political debates. As a representative in the state legislature, Bingham opposed the radical pro-slavery assertions of the Jackson Resolutions proposed by Democrat Claiborne Fox Jackson in 1849. But a majority of the House and Senate supported Jackson's strident legislative support of slavery, and Bingham chose not to run for re-election in 1850. Bingham had grown up with enslaved people in Virginia and Missouri. And as a young man, he had claimed as many as three enslaved people as property. However, in the 1840s and 50s, Bingham's writings indicate that he had developed a moral antipathy towards slavery, opposing its expansion and supporting gradual emancipation. Bingham supported Kansas entering the Union as a free state and strongly opposed the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which declared that residents of Kansas and Nebraska could decide whether or not they wanted slavery in their state through popular sovereignty. When this became an issue in Kansas, some Missourians, including Bingham's political opponents, tried to go into Kansas to vote illegally in its elections. Angry about this behavior, Bingham explicitly stated that he believed slavery to be morally wrong, and by the early 1850s, he no longer claimed slave property. During this period, he also wrote several letters to the editor of the Columbia, Missouri Statesman on this subject, including one in which he declared that slavery was, quote, out of harmony with those principles of equality which lie at the foundation of our great political structure, unquote. In 1856, he traveled to Dusseldorf, Germany to work on his art. So he missed the 1856 election, but he wrote of his support of the first Republican free soil candidate, John C. Fremont, who lost to the pro-slavery Democrat, James Buchanan. Bingham wrote to Rollins that he intended to, quote, march to the music of anti-slavery Missouri politicians whom Bingham hoped would, quote, muster a strong party for emancipation by the time I get back, unquote. Since it would have been easy in the 1850s for Bingham to leave African-Americans out of his election pictures, and here you see an edited version of county election without the figure of the black man serving a drink to the man at left, his decision to include black figures in all three of the compositions is particularly significant. While the paintings do not make overt political statements about slavery, the conspicuous presence of black men at work in the pictures encourages viewers to acknowledge the existence of enslaved people to recognize their labor, and to see them excluded from both freedom and the democratic process. The imagery remains ambiguous enough 
that viewers' reactions would have depended on their political views. But responses would always be predicated on the Black figure's visibility. In other words, Bingham's imagery acknowledges the role of enslaved people in Missouri and America's economic, social, and political landscape, but the viewer is left to determine the morality of that role. Bingham represents the great American drama as it was enacted throughout the nation in the 1850s. The artist and his audience knew that critics at home and abroad wondered whether the United States could long endure as a unified nation that chose its leaders with democratic elections. The Compromise of 1850, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and attempts to manipulate elections in the Kansas Territory cast doubt on the stability of American democratic ideas. Bingham's series, painted in this fragile political climate, argues that despite its pitfalls, the United States had developed a workable system that allowed Americans to govern themselves. This argument was articulated most powerfully when the three paintings were first exhibited as a series together in Washington, D.C. at the fourth annual exhibition of the Washington Art Association in March of 1860. This association was short-lived. It, it existed only from 1856 to 1860, but it held four exhibitions of American art in gallery space loca located on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. And as eight, the 1850s drew to a close, it was a growing enterprise. Bingham joined the organization upon his return to the United States from Germany in 1859 and became its third vice president in 1860. And you see his name here. By that time, the Washington Art Association had grown to include many of the nation's most influential artists. The exhibition of 1860, for example, included works by Henry K. Brown, John McStanley, Joseph Kinzett, Albert Bierstadt, and many others. Unfortunately, the disrupting threat of disunion and the coming civil war put an end to the WAA. And here you see a complaint about the disorganized condition of the 1860 Congress as stalling the organization's progress. However, had the war not intervened, the association might have rivaled the American Art Union in its impact on the na nation's cultural history. Bingham was in Washington, D.C. in January of 1860, and he wrote to his friend James Rollins about the chaos in the Capitol, which he related to the slavery issue and partisan divisions. Congress was at the time struggling to elect a speaker. Bingham writes, you will perceive that the, by the papers that up to this date, no advance whatever has been made towards the organization of the House of Representatives. The Democrats are sadly exercised. They curse by turns John Brown, Helper's Book, and the irrepressible conflict, and are literally worn into tatters without the slightest visible impression upon the Republican ranks, which in defiance of all the assaults of the Democrats, continue to present an unbroken front upon every ballot. The fourth and final exhibition of the Washington Art Association was on view throughout most of the month of March in 1860, amidst the turmoil of the fractious and divided government that looked with trepidation towards the election of 1860. Among the first paintings visitors to the exhibition encountered were George Caleb Bingham's Stump Speaking, The Election, and Results of the Election, otherwise known as Verdict of the People, which seemed to have been displayed consecutively in chronological order as numbers six, seven, and eight in the catalog. Now, since Verdict of the People was not finished until 1855 and Bingham was in Europe between 1856 and 59, this would have been the first time the pictures were ever publicly displayed together as a co coherent series. Bingham 
was in Washington for that 1860 meeting of the Washington Art Association and to prepare for this annual exhibition. The artist wrote to James Rollins on January 9th of 1860 that his election pictures would soon be shipped to the Capitol for the exhibition. He also expressed his somewhat forlorn hope that he might convince the United States Congress to purchase the election series for the government. Quote, I will have my election pictures here in a few days and will endeavor to dispose of them to the Library Committee of Congress. Though such is the depleted state of the treasury that my hopes of success are not very sanguine at present. The artist may have hoped that during this divisive period with the threat of civil war hanging over the country, Americans of differing political beliefs would find common ground in their shared experience of democracy. In 1860, the Washington Art Association exhibition was undoubtedly viewed by members of Congress and the US government, as well as the general public. And here you see an imaginary recreation of the show that gives you a vague idea of what it might have been like to see Bingham's election pictures installed in the exhibition. So back then, of course, they stacked all the paintings. So I've created this image where you can see at, on the top right hand uh, corner, the election pictures lined up together with uh, stump speaking county election and verdict of the people. So, as I conclude this talk, I want to return to Senator Blunt's words about the universality of Bingham's verdict of the people and the idea that Americans can find commonality in their shared experience of democracy. Blunt spoke of people from, quote, all walks of life in this painting. He described people who, quote, were excited, people who were confused, people who wonder what's happened, and people who wonder what's going to happen. Unquote. Today, I have elaborated on these comments, arguing that in the election pictures, Bingham shows Americans with many differing views coming together under one flag. Out of many, Bingham suggests, the election process allows the people of the United States to become one. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. How are that was very interesting. Uh, we have one, one actually one question that was early in the program, but then the the viewer responded that she answered her own question. Uh, but <laughs> she's what uh, when you were talking about the inaugural paintings, uh, what was President Biden's painting? And, oh yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that is kind of interesting because he, of course, it was during COVID, so they didn't mm -hmm. have the luncheon, but they still picked a painting, and what they picked was a really interesting picture. It was by Robert Duncanson, who was a 19th century African-American artist. And he had done a kind of a positive image, probably about hopes uh, of the end of slavery, in which he had represented a beautiful uh, landscape in, in the middle yeah. of the, I guess what we might call the, the, the old Midwest, Ohio, Pennsylvania, that area, uh, a beautiful landscape, uh, uh, of that area with a rainbow behind it. So it was sort of a, an image of hope, which I think maybe had mm -hmm. in his time, it might've had to do with slavery, but um, with Biden, of course, it might've had something to do with COVID crisis. So it was an interesting choice. I think Jill Biden might've been involved in that choice. Okay. Uh, if you have any other questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. And Yeah, it's been interesting how even as as I was working on this, even the thing where Bingham is talking about not being able to choose a speaker <laughs> has <laughs> there's all sorts of interesting connections with the uh, current times. Okay, we've got a couple of thank yous in the chat. Thanks, Joan, and thank you. Good. Okay, well, if we don't have any other questions. I think we can go ahead and, and call it an afternoon. Thank you so much for, for spending time with us this afternoon. I really enjoyed the program and I, I think our audience did too. If you have a moment, please go ahead and take that link and, and complete the survey and I'll uh, 
Oh, oh, well, we get the, the reported talk. Uh, the talk will be put on our YouTube channel uh, probably within a day or two. And I'll send out an email to everyone who registered with the link whenever it's uh, whenever it's uploaded. Okay, good. Good. Okay. Um, in that case, I think I'm going to go ahead and just say goodbye to everyone. Uh, th another thank you. Okay. Uh, Y'all, thank you for joining us today, and we'll hope to see you at future programs. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Joan. <laughs> thank you. All right. Bye-bye.